Good afternoon and very much welcome. On behalf of Columbia University and the School of International and Public Affairs, I'm very pleased to welcome you here today uh, to undertake the 2015 Columbia Global Energy Summit. It's really wonderful to see such a full room of uh, distinguished guests, students, faculty, and others. As one of the great research universities of the world, Columbia is committed to advancing knowledge and learning at the highest level. And the School of International and Public Affairs, of which I have the privilege of being dean, is the interdisciplinary hub of global public policy research, training, and engagement at Columbia. We have a deep and expanding commitment to scholarship around energy and the environment, and this takes many forms a degree concentration in energy and the environment that is educating the next generation of leaders on energy, economics, and geopolitics and environmental matters. Our world-renowned faculty are undertaking significant research across energy fields and disciplines, law, political science, economics, natural sciences, engineering. We have capstone projects that allow our students to gain practical experience with firms and with governments around the world. And of course, SIPA is also home to the Center on Global Energy Policy, which has really very quickly become central to the intellectual life at Columbia and at SIPA around all energy matters. Led by Jason Bordoff, the Center's uh, director, the center's work, like SIPA's, cuts across issues that are homegrown, that are cross-border, and that are international in nature. And energy lies at the nexus of many of the world's most urgent problems, um, really very difficult challenges, which is why the center's aim of providing independent data-driven analysis to help U.S. and global policymakers navigate the complex world of energy, I think is all the more critical and enormously timely. So in addition to a very robust research agenda on the economics and geopolitics of energy, a truly remarkable and highly active public events program that has brought policymakers, energy practitioners, and other thought leaders to Columbia. The center has also attracted a very distinguished group of fellows. And it supports our students through research assistant positions and recently launched a Women in Energy program geared specifically at supporting female Columbia students interested in pursuing careers in the energy sector. So SIPA and the center are, of course, enriched by being part of one of the world's great research universities in this fantastic city of New York, which makes it possible for us to convene key players from the academy, from policy and business circles from around the world. I see the center increasingly as a resource for the entire university and indeed the energy sector globally. We believe this symposium reflects the unique strengths of Columbia University, of SIPA, and the Center, and I very much hope that this event will inspire and foster conversations and ideas on global energy policy challenges ahead. I should say it is a true pleasure to work with Jason Bordoff and his team, and I am confident that with our collective aspiration for excellence and impact, the work of the center is already and will continue to make a tremendous contribution. Please join me in welcoming Jason Bordoff to join us and open this event. Thank you so much, Dean Janow, uh, for taking time to be with us today for your extraordinary leadership here at SEPA and for the support you've provided as we've built the Center on Global Energy Policy. I also want to thank President Bollinger, our Provost John Coatsworth, and the rest of Columbia's leadership and my colleagues at SEPA uh, for their strong commitment to the Center's growth and success. Uh, I'm going to start the Columbia Energy Summit 
in 60 seconds, but I want to try something first and see if it works. Uh, I, like many people, we have about 400 people in the room right now. We have several hundred more watching online, uh, maybe thousands, I'm not sure. Um, and I, like most people here, have been heartbroken looking at the pictures coming out in Nepal over the last few days. And if everyone here were to take their cell phones out right now, or those of you inclined to do so, and text Red Cross, all one word, to 90999, we collectively would raise five or six thousand dollars to help the relief effort in Nepal. I'm gonna do that right now, because it takes about 20 seconds. And if anyone else were so inclined to do that, It was that easy. Apparently, you have to reply help to make sure you're supposed to do it. Thanks to all of you who took the time to do that. And uh, again, our thoughts go out to everyone uh, who suffered a tremendous tragedy there. Um, now we're going to start the 2015 Columbia Global Energy Summit. <clears throat> this past uh, Thursday, actually, marked two years exactly to the day since many people here came together in this room uh, in this majestic hall to launch the Center on Global Energy Policy. And since then, we've assembled a world-class team uh, that has built the Center into a leading platform for research, for convening, for dialogue about understanding our shared energy future. We come to work here at the Center each and every day dedicated to this mission because we, like all of you, believe there's not a more important economic, geopolitical, or environmental issue in the world today than energy. And because we know that improving public understanding and getting policy right is key to meeting our shared energy challenges. How to pull a billion more people out of poverty, how to support rapid economic growth, how to promote geopolitical cooperation rather than conflict, how to enhance U.S. security, and how to do all of these things in a way that does not damage the planet. I'm really proud of everything that we've achieved in just two years, and I'm even more excited about what's to come. Let me mention just a couple of the highlights. We've built a team that includes several of the world's leading energy experts from academia, from the public and private sectors. We've become a leading venue for convening the world's top energy leaders through public events like today's and through public, uh, through Chatham House uh, rule roundtables that bring experts together from multiple backgrounds. We're reaching the world through our podcasts, through our webcasts, through social media, through physical convenings thanks to Colombia's global centers in energy uh, capitals like Beijing, Rio, uh, Istanbul, London, Addis Ababa, and elsewhere. Uh, we're producing timely, policy-relevant research on topics from Iran sanctions to Chinese shale to Mexico's reforms from energy exports to ethanol and many others in between. We've become a leading resource for informing today's most important energy debates through media and through many other outlets. And as you heard Dean Jay now talk about, most importantly with our mission here at Columbia, we're training the next generation of energy leaders. And as you heard, I'm really excited today that we're able to announce the latest effort in this regard. Uh, last January, uh, some of you may have joined us when Lady Barbara Judge helped us uh, launch a women in energy program which uh, provided which provides networking and career development activities, mentorship opportunities, real world training and practical experience to female Columbia students interested in careers in the energy sector. And thanks to a very generous grant from the Sloan Foundation, we're now able to expand that program throughout uh, the region and eventually the country and hopefully the world. And I want to thank the Sloan Foundation and Ka Wei on our staff, who is in the back there in red, very distinctive, uh, for, uh, for her remarkable work leading the program and helping uh, secure the resources to expand it uh, much further. Let me also just take a moment to thank many of the others who've contributed so generously to our success the members of the Center's Advisory Board, many of whom are here with us today, the Center's Fellows and Faculty Affiliates, also many of whom are here today, the wonderful team at the Center and SEPA, I won't name them all, and if I talked about all the extraordinary contributions they make, it would take up half the conference. But I especially want to mention Jesse McCormick, the Center's Associate Director. 
Jesse took a leap of faith two and a half years ago when he agreed to leave the White House and uh, come and join me here in New York uh, to undertake this endeavor. And no one has worked, including myself, no one has worked harder, been more committed, or been more instrumental to the center's success. We simply couldn't be doing it without him. So uh, please join me in thanking uh, Jesse, who's here somewhere. Um, <clears throat> Before I mention our first keynote uh, speaker, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Please silence your cell phones at this uh, point. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A throughout the day. If you'd like to ask a question, you can write it on the note cards and pass it to an usher, and they'll be collected and given to the moderators. For those watching online, or I guess those too lazy to write something on an index card, you can also uh, uh, tweet your questions for our speakers uh, to our Twitter handle, at ColumbiaUEnergy using the hashtag CGEP, Center of Global Energy Policy, uh, the hashtag CGEP events. After our first speaker, uh, I'm going to ask David Sandelo to come on stage and have a conversation with her. David is the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy, formerly the Undersecretary of Energy and Acting Secretary of Energy for International Policy Affairs. He's been an invaluable partner to me. Uh, in building the center. His areas of research include China, clean energy finance, international climate negotiations, and, uh, and, and, and many other uh, critically important areas. And he's going to have a conversation today with our first keynote speaker, the administrator of the EPA, Gina McCarthy. The EPA, as you know, creates and enforces environmental regulations protecting our land, our water, our air, and Gina's at the helm of what is perhaps the signature element of uh, President Obama's climate action plan, regulations under the Clean Air Act to address carbon emissions from the power sector. And those of you who saw the president terrify his anger translator at the correspondence dinner know just how passionate he is about doing something on this issue. Uh, Gina has unique experience at both the federal and state levels, having led Connecticut's EPA, having worked in Massachusetts for, uh, for five governors, including Mitt Romney. Even among those critical of the EPA, I think she's widely seen as being tough, but fair, pragmatic, and wicked smart. I think I, I, did, I, I, did I pronounce that right? All right. She can do the accent better than I can. Um, she doesn't shy away from hostile territory, whether it's the EPA administrator going into coal country or a diehard Red Sox fan coming into the backyard of Yankee Stadium here in Morningside Heights. Uh, it's been, it was really a true privilege to work with her in the administration when she was head of the Air Office, uh, an equally great privilege to welcome her here today. Please join me in welcoming the EPA Administrator, Gina McCarthy. Can you hear that? Should I keep doing that? It's annoying, isn't it? You'll all wake up anyways. Well, first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dean, for inviting me. And also, uh, Jason, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I have to tell you that uh, one reason uh, people actually work at the White House is because it's crazy and it's fun. Uh, but most of them leave because they think it's an opportunity for them to slow down. Um, apparently, neither Jason nor David actually got that memo. Uh, because they haven't figured out how to do that. Um, they've been uh, incredibly busy building a, a really valuable go-to resource that really is, is uh, becoming more and more known as, as having an ability to, to think about complex energy and environmental challenges together, which is actually what we all have to do. And I think in a short time, their center really has become a premier platform for really informed policy decisions um, as well as timely research and, and how we look at all these issues together. So kudos to them for leaving the White House and, and realizing that there was an opportunity that on, others haven't seen to jump from the frying pan into the fire. Uh, so thanks for that. And it's, it's great to be, be here. Um, and uh, let me begin with, with I think, is a, a fairly simple statement, and we can talk about this a little bit more when David comes out. Um, I think that the action EPA is taking uh, really mirror the direction in which investments in the energy world are already heading. And my main point is that a low carbon future is absolutely inevitable. The question really is how quickly will that come about and who's going to win? 
in the race to take economic advantage as that transition happens. So I think I'd ask you please not to take my word for it. I spent a great time, and I know uh, Dan is here at, at Sarah uh, talking about these things. And I'll try not to talk about them too long so that we can have a conversation. But at the Sarah Global Energy Conference in Houston, I really tried to challenge the energy world to think not just about the direction they're heading, but how EPA's rule can help reinforce that direction, uh, but also to think about what they're already doing and what, that's, what signal that sends for themselves and for the rest of the world, because it was filled with all of the, the top executives. Um, and the point I made to that industry was that billions of dollars are being put every year towards maintaining our energy infrastructure and making it as high performance as possible. Let me give you an example. In 2013, investor-owned utilities spent nearly $17 billion on transmission. That was just in, in 2013 alone. And that's just on transmission alone. So the real question is that they're investing constantly. The real challenge for this world to send and for EPA to think about is what signal do we want to send in terms of that continued investment? Well, let's look at what they're already doing. Let's look at what happened between 2000 and 2010. When you look at spending on electricity and gas utility, customer funded energy efficiency programs. Because in that period of time, those programs doubled. Was it because they were being forced to do that? Or was that because it was a clear recognition that they were really good investments? And what does that say for the direction in which EPA should be underpinning that type of a transition? Because my argument is that investments are already happening. Our rule can look at the transition that is happening in the energy world, and instead of running against the tide, let's put some wind in those sails. Let's put a marker down about what long-term investment should happen if we can all agree that a low-carbon future is essential to pursue and that the job of the United States is to win the race to be the first to get there and to use our power and our influence to convince the rest of the world that that is how they should also be investing, that it's not punishment, it's an opportunity for greater productivity. That is the challenge, I think, before us. Now we're doing our rule in a way that I believe is going to not just send a long-term signal, but also explain to people that action on climate is not just a moral responsibility, which it is, and this president has made that abundantly clear, but it also happens to be the economic prudent thing to do. That is essential for us to keep thinking about. Now, how do I know that it's economically prudent to do this? Because I believe that money speaks louder than words. We've heard that before. In this case, the investments in the energy world speak louder than any rhetoric against the direction towards a low carbon future. Because according to FERC, over the past three years, the power sector brought online 60 gigawatts of cleaner generation, 24 giga gigawatts of natural gas capacity, and more than 27 gigawatts of new renewable energy. They already did that. The value proposition is that the more efficient you are, not more generation capacity, but the more efficient you are on a levelized cost basis, that these new energy efficiency programs are really cutting your costs in terms of, of meeting energy service needs by one half to one third. So if you look at the value proposition of energy efficiency as part of your generation mix versus traditional generation capacity being added, you are cutting your costs tremendously. And the value of carbon conscious market is extending to every sector of our economy, not just a chosen few. The American auto industry's resurgent was, was resurgence was actually propelled by ratcheting up fuel efficiency. It became part of what transitioned a dying economy in the U.S. in terms of a resurgent and growing economy. EPA has 1,600 Energy Star partners. Now, these are not just little guys. These are big companies sitting around the table. Many of them are Fortune 500 companies, and they are all in on efficiency. 
Now, I know they like to stand up with EPA and take credit for that, but frankly, it's all about their bottom line. And frankly, I couldn't be happier that it is about their bottom line. That's the signal we're trying to send. And banks like Citigroup are investing hundreds of billions of dollars in clean energy. People are standing up and they are agreeing that a low carbon future is not just inevitable, it is profitable because companies are responding to ongoing clean energy market trends that we can bolster by sending the kind of long-term signal that this president wants to send about the need to move forward on carbon. Let's send a signal to the market that is the largest generator of carbon pollution and let's get there together. Now, I also wanna point out that in my home away from home in Connecticut, where I spent five lovely years, there was this company called Fuel Cell Energy. They innovated a way to capture carbon as a cheap byproduct of running a fuel cell. Now, we are not just talking about the cake. We now have frosting here, folks. We don't just have the technologies we can rely on. You can add technologies to those that make a great technology even better. And they are now working on how to scale that technology uh, up so that it can operate at a coal plant. You know, America is already bullish on clean energy and a low carbon economy. That is my argument. That is what money and investments are telling me. And EPA simply wants to send the right signal so they can feel sure that when they double down, it's going to be profitable to them. And we will do this in a way, and this is can't be emphasized enough, and I'll probably say it 52 times when we're talking with David, but we will not threaten energy reliability, nor will we change the dynamic in terms of delivering both a reliable and affordable energy to people in this country that need it. At the end of the day, the aim of the clean power plant is to cut carbon pollution from our power plants, but we will do that in a way that maintains reliability and affordability of the supply. We can do it. That's the plain and simple message. So let me be clear. I simply will not accept a standard coming out of this process or a compliance scenario from the states coming into our process under the Clean Power Plan that actually is causing reliability to be questioned. There is simply no need of it. We have made this a process of engagement for every human being. Before we did the rule, we're going to keep that moving forward. We are going to have plans in place that bring these standards to reality. The final 111D rule will give utilities the absolute time and the space that they need, as well as states, to make their choices that are in line with their economic and energy strategies to be able to deliver plans and reductions that maintain reliability first, that also have a long-term plan to make sure that that reliability is being met in a low carbon strategy. We have that latitude, we sent it out, we know how to do this, and in fact, we can talk about this a lot, but we've been hanging around for 45 years and me, a little bit longer than that, two or three years. Uh, I actually uh, have been down this rodeo before. <laughs> I know how to write rules. I know how to work with states. I have worked at a state for 20 years. I am quite sure that no state wants to write a plan that's going to shut down their economy. Usually they just ask us to let them keep their economy growing. And guess what? For 45 years, we've been able to do that in partnership with the states. Now, these economics make sense because they really align not just with what's happening today, but the history of EPA. We have always been able to meet our environmental challenges in a way that made that environment part of the foundation of a growing economy. None of this is window dressing, folks. This is the time in our lives where we're not balancing energy and environment. We are actually marrying them together so that people can have a robust future. So I wanna thank all of you for inviting me. I think we are on a road for the United States to be a global leader um, on climate, just as we have been at EPA, a global leader in environmental governance. We know how to do this. And from the UN Climate Summit last September to the joint US-China climate announcement last year, 
to the recent submittals of our carbon reduction targets to the UN. We believe that it is no longer a question if the United States is going to act. The question is how we will, and EPA is tremendously proud of, to, of our ability to deliver those actions. I'm doing it to provide Secretary Kerry and also Todd Stern continued leverage in the international discussion. I think that uh, I have been seen and talked to just about every environmental leader from every other country asking me one simple question. Is this, is this plan, is this clean power plan real? My answer is unequivocally yes. Will we lead the charge to a low carbon future? My answer is unequivocally yes. What I don't tell them is that we're going to do it in a way which allows the U.S. to actually lead that effort and to reap the economic benefits associated with that. They'll figure it out, and we'll all get there together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Administrator McCarthy. That was tremendous. I want to start by asking you about a story that's in the news today. Uh, in the Vatican today, Pope Francis is hosting a meeting on climate change. Do you have any thoughts about Pope Francis and his work on this issue? Well, let me admit first that I'm a Catholic, but I don't think you need to be to think he's a really cool person. <laughs> uh, he, he's had an, uh, just an amazing impact, and his reach is, is very large. And I know I spent a little bit of time at the Vatican uh, meeting to some, with some of his advisors just a few months ago, and that's because, in, in my opinion, we need all voices to sing about the challenge of climate change and the impact that it has on not just protecting our natural resources uh, that the Pope is so interested in protecting, but he also thinks very much about how the efforts we take on climate can protect those that are most vulnerable to the changing climate, uh, our low income and our minority communities, and in his case, countries. And so I think we had an, I had an opportunity to talk to them about the work that the United States is doing, but he also looks at it as a way of building an inclusive economy which is some of the, the, the work that I find most interesting. And so we had a chance to talk. I think it's great that he's highlighting this issue. I think it's wonderful that, that I've had an opportunity to share with him what the U.S. is doing so he can see what leadership looks like and how the, there is not just a tremendous challenge that we have before us, but it is a very hopeful challenge. I tried to make it very clear to them that, in my opinion, uh, 20 years ago was hard on climate. Today we are on the cusp of, of, of moving forward because we have technologies that are available. We have technologies that people like that work that are getting less expensive every day. And if, and if our last challenges are any indication in the United States, every time we, we, we embrace a challenge, we win economically. We bring innovations to the table. Uh, and we will get there together. So it was a wonderful opportunity for me to be there. And I think his trip in September is going to be very timely here and very productive. And I, I just want to add that I think the, the, it, under the Pope's leadership, we will spread the word in countries we don't generally have an ability to reach as effectively. But there are faith groups everywhere that are embracing this issue. And they have an ability in the, in the United States and beyond to really reach people in a way that resonates to them. And we do have to make climate change personal, because it will take everybody lifting this boat and steering it in a direction that will be helpful for all of us. Well, let's talk about the Clean Power Plan, which you, you did in your remarks. Um, and I, I know you get asked about the Clean Power Plan a lot, mm -hmm. but how much of your time would you say you're spending on the Clean Power Plan, by the way? Um, how much time? A, a, a lot. Um, you know, it, it's it's hard not to when you have a president that basically says he wants to see this be really good, and he's out in front on it. Uh, but it's work that I've been doing really my whole professional life. Well, not whole, but past 20 years or so, because I was pretty instrumental in the development of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and getting that over the finish line. And, and I've developed plans for Massachusetts and Connecticut and worked on others to try to address this issue. So it's a, a lot of my time and increasingly more because we, we started actually talking about the Clean Power Plan without calling it that three years ago. I mean, many of you are actually sitting at some of those focus groups tables, and we've continued. It is unprecedented dialogue, because this is an unprecedentedly important. Is that a word, unprecedentedly? It is Whatever. Now, yeah. Yeah. 
the university folks can correct me. Uh, it, it's, it's just an incredibly important rule, and it deserves that kind of attention. But to be honest with you, I spent at least two solid hours every week in formal meetings looking at what we're doing, how we're talking about it, how's the rule coming, and now I'm spending probably half of my time thinking and talking about it. Um, and every time I go out, this is where I'm going. I'm talking about two things primarily when I leave my office, and I leave a lot to talk to people. It's predominantly climate change, and in the other area, it's, it's predominantly uh, our new water rule that we're trying to get out to land the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act, because to me it's one and the same. If you're looking at climate change, the place where it's fir first is going to hit is, is water resources. And we're seeing that already in California. You know, I want to come back to the Clean Power Plan in a minute, but this water energy connection is so strong, and you just brought up energy. Could you just say a word about what you're doing on water and how it might impact the energy sector? Yeah, uh, we're actually looking at um, how we can make sure that we're protecting water resources effectively. This, the water program is, a, is really, a uh, water program is, is more of a partnership with the states than anything because states really have to manage water quantity issues. So the challenge for us is to recognize that we have to use science of today to determine which waters are most important to protect. And what we have identified is these, you know, small streams, headwaters, these ephemeral streams, the ones that don't run 24 hours of every day, really feed one third of the people in this country their drinking water. It's essential to protect, and they're at risk today. The other challenge in a changing climate, though, is that you have to learn how to keep water local, how to allow it to soak into the ground, how to recognize that pollution is not going to be assimilated as effectively if the streams are going to be running at half volume as the future changes. And so we have to look at how we do business all around to protect ourselves from both the storm surges that we are seeing today, as well as the droughts we are seeing. And in many ways, we're returning back to nature. It's called green infrastructure. Uh, it, kind, of a, kind of a weird name, but it's nature. Um, in order to, to see how you actually manage the future of our water resources. And it's, it's challenging, but it's extraordinarily important for our communities and the work we do as, as a core environmental agency. Uh, on the Clean Power Plan, Senator McConnell has recommended to states that they don't submit implementation plans. If a state did that, would a citizen in that state be better off, in your opinion? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I, but first of all, let me say that, that we are continually working with states, as we always have, and states are not running off into the night from these tables. They're actually asking us to have a second and third conversation, because they're rolling up their sleeves as, as they, they would normally do. And they know when we regulate under the Clean Air Act, we pretty much know what we're doing. And, and once we're regulating, it does require that uh, us to act in partnership. So I'm pretty confident that states are, are doing just fine, um, and that's because we're really talking to them and continuing to work with them. But a state would be better off only because it's not that we cannot and won't have an ability to Im impose a federal uh, standard, um, but, but uh, in a federal plan, I should say. But the most important thing is that they get to design their own, their own plans. This, our 111D, which is what we call our clean power plan, is, is basically the most respectful rule that our agency has ever done in terms of the federal government giving a standard and allowing entire flexibility for states to design that for themselves. Why wouldn't you want to do that? It really takes advantage of where the economies are of the future, where the energy in that state is heading. They have every opportunity to do it better than we could, although we think we can do a very adequate job, and we will if, if we have to. I have an excellent and very specific question on exactly that topic from somebody in the audience who says, analysis shows that the structure of the clean power plan as proposed will create situations where the same power plan on either side of a state line can be a compliance burden or an aid yeah. to compliance. In light of this, is asking each state to reduce its emissions proportionately the best plan stand approach? Well, you really don't have to do it that way. And, and we, we raise that issue because uh, there is, while we've created standards state by state, the response to states can be regional in nature. They can, they can take whatever approach they want as long as they design it and it's not left up in the air about who's responsible for what. 
And so they can design a system, for example, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is a collaboration between nine states that do exactly that. They actually have a, an allowance system, they auction the allowances, they spend lots of money on energy efficiency, they've made a ton of money while they've reduced their carbon emissions. This stuff can work. And so states are, are free to do whatever they would like. We have, it, the interesting thing is that we made this so flexible we gave them examples of what they could do, and now they're they are saying, could you give us less flexibility or at least tell us how we might do this? So part of the work that we're doing is to develop a model rule that will show them how it could be done while still maintaining all their flexibility. This is really not as rocket science as people might like to make it out to be. We've had an acid rain program that's run a cap and trade program. States in Calif the state of California has its own program. You've got Reggie, there's models for this and we've known how to do it for a long time. We're just asking states to take the first crack and step up and see wh where they come. But we also know how to manage these types of programs ourselves as well. Thank you. For those listening on podcast, we're here at the Columbia Global Energy Summit 2015. My name is David Sandalo, and I'm here with EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy. Uh, Administrator McCarthy, let's turn away from the clean power plan and talk about some other topics and start with one that's controversial right here in New York, which is fracking. Uh, so is fracking good for the environment or bad for the environment? Well, fracking, I think, has opened up tremendous opportunities as a technology for a wealth in, in domestic supplies that has really changed the game. I think both for, for the U.S. in terms of its economy and national security, which others can speak to. But, but for me, it's changed the game in terms of how the energy system is working and what's of most value. Uh, for me, I think the inexpensive natural gas that's been produced has allowed us to make leaps and bounds uh, uh, progress on the air pollution side and it will continue to underpin a growth towards a low carbon future, which we will underpin with our clean power plan. So for me, the, the question really is, how do I work with states to continue to get them the information to ensure that it's done safe and responsibly? That's the key. Uh, from, in my world, that's the gold star. And so we're working really hard with the states on those issues, and, and we're doing a lot of research on where the opportunities are for, for potential problems, and how are states working at this, and how do we all work together? There have been some news stories in the past week about earthquakes caused by fracking. Does EPA have authority under the Safe Drinking Water Act to regulate under a reinjection of fracking fluids to protect communities against earthquakes? I think there's a lot, a lot of ways to do that, David. And, and we were happy to participate in, in the work group that helped to pull together the information um, on, on the earthquakes that we're seeing. And I was pretty proud of Oklahoma standing up and, and recognizing the challenge. They, they have some excellent people working in that, that uh, state. And they, they're prepared for this challenge, uh, as are we. We'll work with them. Uh, I think that they have every reason to be able to uh, address this challenge themselves and the technologies available. We can also work with them on it. You're right, we manage an underground injection program that, that's working with them as well. Um, and I think one of the great things about all of these challenges with fracking is that it's, while the, the, the fracking that we're seeing is taking advantage of very new and cutting edge technology, the engineering you need to keep it safe and responsible is actually pretty traditional. We know how to do this. And, and the seismic issues are not a result of the fracking itself, but of the, the water being put back in and how to do that in a way that doesn't cause uh, these problems. And I think we all know how to do it. We just have to work together and get it done. Uh, EPA's had a study on groundwater impacts of fracking in the worst world. Anything you can tell us about the timetable for release of that? Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be coming out soon. I know that we say soon a lot, and that can mean the next century, but it's soon in everybody's terms of the word. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to actually putting it out because I think it will provide just an, another layer of information for states. I think every state that is, is, uh, uh, has uh, fracking operations understands that that it is challenging and they want the, the safe and responsible fracking and be able to assure their, their constituents that they work for that, that they're doing the best job they can. So I want that information to get out soon and it's coming. All right, uh, let's move to another controversial technology, nuclear power. Is, is it nuclear? I should talk longer because you continue to bring more controversies <laughs> as we go. Is, is nuclear power good for the environment or bad for the environment? Not my call. 
David, if you remember, you work for the Department of Energy. <laughs> I work for the Department of the Environment, and I, I'm sticking to that. You know, this, this is my job. You know, obviously, uh, nuclear is a, a zero carbon technology because, of course, it's part of the mix, but it's also part of the energy supply, both in terms of it's the baseload of what we have to work with um, that is part of the baseline of where, where states are today. And st some states have chosen it to be a major factor in where they're, where they're going in the future. You know, we have, you know, Georgia. Tennessee, others that are really South Carolina, investing in, in you know, pretty expensive but reliable nuclear energy. Um, that's part of the mix. We have also the challenge of some of the older facilities that have been operating effectively at zero carbon, and, and are they going to be relicensed? Can they be relied on in the future? Those are challenges that we're calling the attention of the states about, but I have to be really careful, and I always am, to remember that my job is carbon pollution reduction. I want to make sure that as we've designed this, that there's a flexibility for every fuel to be in the mix today and tomorrow, because my job isn't to pick and choose what I like best. It's to pick and choose how do we make, it, make states able to achieve these reductions in a way that they make choices in the market, frankly makes choices about, about what the future brings. I just have to make sure the flexibility there is to have this be a reasonable approach moving forward. Okay, one more good or bad question. Ethanol. Is ethanol good for the environment or bad for the environment? Well, again, <laughs> I, I'm, not a, I'm not a member of com Congress. And frankly, I doubt I ever will be. It's not been an aspiration. It's less of an aspiration now than it's ever been for me. Oh, that's okay. Um, so e ethanol is, is th this is really about biofuels, which really is a, a large part, I think, of the, the solution in, in terms of growing a, a low carbon future and, and an economy. And the president has embraced it. The challenge with the renewable fuel standard is for EPA right now to catch up and send that longer term signal. But Congress gave us a clear signal in, in the renewable fuel standard. The gold standard are the advanced. Uh, technologies that we are see finally bringing some advanced biofuels into the market. We're actually generating the millions of RINs now. Yippee, it's been a lot longer than people had hoped, but they're there. Ethanol clearly becomes part of the mix, and it, it's in there, and it's going to be continuing. But our challenge is to, to pay respect to what Congress told us about what that mix ought to be and how aggressive we can be, and to make sure we catch up this year, which we're going to. I'm going to bring in a few questions from the audience as well. Um, uh, one of them asks you, how is renewable power such a win economically as a standalone investment without massive government subsidies? I think, well, one of the things to do is to make sure that, that the market embraces it by putting a price on carbon. And as, as much as we have done, that is clearly what the, our standard is going to be. You're going to have to achieve these reductions. And, and I think the question then becomes, what's the winning strategy? What's the market going, going to buy in order to achieve those standards? And I, I do not know anybody that projected the kind of growth in solar um, that people are seeing. And I want people to understand, I mean, maybe folks here, because everybody's really smart here, wicked smart here, uh, get this. That's how you say wicked smart. I just wanted to make sure I got that in. Uh, the, the, I think we are seeing growth in renewables that, that are, where they're on, if they're not already, they're on the cusp of being very competitive. They are being bid into the markets these days. The integration is there and available in so many areas. So really the question becomes is states figuring out whether, it, whether their strategy to a low carbon future is best met by doing quick transitions to natural gas or a longer transition to a more diverse system and one that will be frankly more sustainable over the long term, which is renewables and efficiency programs. And I am pretty bullish on renewables, not just from the standpoint that they're marketable today, they're available, they're getting cheaper all the time. People like them. <laughs> they enjoy having this type of uh, distributed generation. They enjoy demand reductions that can save the money on their bills today. So you're asking people basically to swallow a pill that is actually not just very good for them, but tastes good. 
And so I think there's going to be tremendous market opportunities here. And the last thing I'd point out is that if you look at where the jobs are, that is where the jobs are. It's all about clean energy. That solar industry put more than 26,000 people to work, new jobs in 2014 alone. It is the fastest job growth of any sector in this country. So this is not, again, about choosing to make investments that won't pay off economically for everybody. It is, in fact, the direct opposite. So I'm pretty excited about renewables. You people should be, too. I just want you to point that out. We've got a few more minutes, uh, and I've got really two buckets of, of questions that are coming in from the crowd. One, one of them is about international issues and, and asks, um, how can we incentivize other countries to make necessary investments to decarbonize? Um, and there are a few questions about the Paris process. Maybe you could comment on, on those sets of issues. Well, quickly, but I, I think you're going to have some of those conversations. Are you going to have some of those conversations later in the day? But okay, your, your let, let me just. Are unequal, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, 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 won't, um, I, I think that one of the greatest signals about the U.S. in terms of our domestic commitment and the president's leadership on this was the signal that was sent with the joint agreement with China. And I, and I think maybe you need to be more engaged in, in having gone to all of the cops as, as I have for so long to see what a dramatic shift that was. And, and getting China to the table was really to stop talking so much about intensity and really agree that they've got to, to hit a level and go down and make that commitment. And the, and the commitment they have for renewables I want you to understand that's larger than, than what it would take to replace the entire energy generation with renewables in the United States, pretty dramatically and pretty quickly. And so the commitment is huge. So there is a, a strength in, in the largest economy speaking to this issue that I think sends signals to the other economies. And the most important message, I hope, is not just that, that the larger economies can do this, but that if you think about these issues and, and the opportunity for growth in, in the developing countries, that they will see this as an immediate roadway for them to do what the Pope said, which is to have a more inclusive economy, to do what this president says, which is to bring people out of poverty and up the ladder uh, to the middle class, no matter how you phrase this. This should be looked at as an absolute economic strategy that has tremendous environmental benefit. You know, the great thing about working for this president is he teed this up not as an environmental issue, but as a public health issue, as an economic issue, as a national security issue, and frankly, as an economic opportunity. And if we can keep thinking about it through that lens, it won't be twisting the arms of the large countries to support those developing countries, but it will be everybody twisting everybody's arm to learn the lessons that the United States have learned, that you can grow economically without destroying your economy and figuring out how to spend billions later repairing what you destroyed. There is a path forward that can get both. We'd love to keep going, but last question, how are you feeling about the Red Sox prospects? Actually, pretty good. Pretty good, but, but if you ask me that every time, that is exactly what I would say because I would lie through my teeth, especially <laughs> in New York. Please join me in giving Administrator McCarthy a huge hand.